Well, good evening, Generation Impact. I'm so excited to be with you this evening. And we are dealing with topic 399. All right. And so I wanted to say that we're coming to the end of a cycle. And uh, we have got 400 topics. And then we start again at number one. Okay. So I want to just say that if you would like to join our college, you can join any time during the four-year cycle. And uh, tonight will be the last evening of our first cycle. Okay. So we are dealing with topic 399. And I'm dealing with a topic entitled, The Fruit of the Spirit Lived Out. The Fruit of the Spirit Lived Out. And let's just pray as we come online. Father, right now, I pray that you'll minister to each one of us. Lord, as we come around your word, and we genuinely, genuinely submit to everything that you have for us in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that as we study your word tonight, Lord, that we will understand the practical working of what you have for us and where you want us to go. Lord, I thank you right now that you'll minister to each and every one of us. And Lord, that we genuinely will learn something in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen and Amen. All right, let's get right into uh, tonight's topic. Tonight I would like to deal with the fruit of the Spirit. And there's some very important things that we need to understand when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit. Because the Bible says that you're not supposed to judge somebody by the actions. The Bible says don't judge him by the gifting. But the Bible says, judge a person by his fruit. And so this is very important that we get the fruit of the Spirit sorted out. That we understand how the fruit of the Spirit works in somebody's life. And we also know what to do to bring it into our being. In other words, how do I practice the fruit of the Spirit in my life? Because the Bible says that that is how you're supposed to judge me. You're welcome to judge the fruit of what I do. And how I do it. And so if that is the case, I need to understand how this works. Now, Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23 gives us the fruit of the Spirit. Now before I even give you the fruit of the Spirit, I need you to understand. This is the fruit of the Spirit. It has been given through God by the Holy Spirit. You are not going to be able to practice any one of these fruits in your own strength. Why? Because we always limit it to the way that we are feel, uh, how we feel and also how we've been dealt with. So in other words, if I you make me happy, I'm going to be fine with you. If you make me upset, I'm going to be upset with you too. And so when we look at the fruit of the Spirit... We have got to understand that this is the fruit coming from the Holy Spirit. Amen? All right, so let's have a look. Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 23 says this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now there are nine fruits of the Spirit. There are nine demonstrations of the Holy Spirit working through me that is going to be supernatural. So, we need to understand that these nine gifts, uh, these nine fruits, are not something that you naturally have. Alright? If it was your natural part of you, it would have been listed under the things of the flesh. In other words, the things that it naturally have. God would not have put it in as the fruit of the Spirit, separately from what our natural abilities are, if it was not supernatural in itself. So let's have a look. Now, there's three categories here. Number one is the supernatural gifting that God gives us for the first three, and I'll explain what that means. The second is how we deal with Christian relationships. And the third one are Christian characteristics that we should show. So there's three groups of three. So let's look at the first three. All right. Love, joy, and peace. 
These are things that God supernaturally gives us. Not that He's going to not give us the others. The Holy Spirit is going to work in them. But if God does not give us these three, there's no ways that you can even come close to it. The others, you could still try and be the best person that you can. You could still try and get close to some of them. But you cannot get close to these three unless God supernaturally intervenes. And so these three are part of the anchors because everything flows from these. Number one is love. See, the Bible says that God has poured out His love into our hearts. Romans chapter 5 verse 5, it says this. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So I want you to understand that even if God gives it, the Holy Spirit is the one who is part of His fruit. If the Holy Spirit is operating in your life, these nine fruit are going to be present. If the Holy Spirit is not operating in your life, these nine fruit will be limited. Okay? And it's very easy to see if the fruit of the Spirit is operating in somebody's life or not. It is very easy to see if they genuinely have a supernatural ability to do some of these things. So let's look at love. So love is the agape love. In other words, the unconditional love. The love of, of able, where you're able to love somebody even if they don't love you back. Now this is very important because the love of God is so, so critical. It is so, so important that God gives you an ability to love somebody supernaturally. God gives you the ability to love somebody supernaturally that is totally against Everything that you are made up of. Everything that you were designed for. But yet God gives you this ability to love. That's unconditional love. That does not come out of the natural. Right? I've used this example many times. The first time I saw this was when a lady stood up with her mother and said that I am the result of a rape where somebody broke into the house and somebody raped my mother. And so I'm a direct result of a rape. Now I want to say that this is really terrible. But she says, I love the person who did it with God's love because they were hurting when they did it. They were demonized when they did it. No normal person just does this. Now, I cannot understand that. It does not comprehend with me. But I understood that it was a God-given supernatural love that flowed. And this is what we are talking about is when you can love the unlovely who does not deserve it. All right. Now Paul breaks this down even more in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And he says, he breaks it into various components. But one of the things about 1 Corinthians chapter 13 you realize very clearly is not an emotion. Love is not an emotion. It's a supernatural ability to show somebody how God loves them, how God sees them. And it is not the way that you feel at the time. Right? Now let's go to joy. A joy is an inner rejoicing that abides despite outside circumstances. Now, I want to make this statement. Joy is not happiness. Happiness is determined how I feel at the time. You know, in my case, if I watch a good Top Gun movie or I, or I eat some marshmallows or whatever it is that you do, all right, you feel happy. It is fun. It is exciting. And you're suddenly having fun and that's happiness. But joy is when there's an overwhelming sense 
of excitement, even though you shouldn't be excited about something. And this is something that's really important because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. So my strength in my spiritual walk is determined by how much joy I can operate in. How do I operate in joy? Remember, every one of these is by the Holy Spirit. The more I allow the Holy Spirit to operate in my life, the more of these fruits I'm going to have. The characteristic of joy has little to do with happiness and can exist in times of being very unhappy. It's a deep and nourishing satisfaction that continues even when life situation seems empty and very unsatisfying at the time. But yet you can have the joy of the Lord. And I've seen people that just have absolute joy. They permanently are joyful no matter what's going on. And I mean, I'll tell you, I know some of them well. And I see what's going on around them. I see the mess and I see the chaos. But yet, they have the joy of the Lord no matter what. Number three is the peace. The peace of God. This is a peace that cannot be explained. Okay? Ephesians, uh, sorry, Philippians chapter 4 verse 7. It says this, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? It means that the peace of God comes on me in such a way that despite what's going on around me, despite what I can see, sense, or feel, I have total peace that God is in control. Now, there have been countless opportunities for me to get into this situation. Where I've been in a crisis and things are going wrong around me and things are not working out and whatever else. But in the name of Jesus Christ, I have a supernatural peace that comes into that situation. And I know, like I know, like I know that God is going to come through for me. I want to say this, saints. Let's allow the Spirit of God to work in our lives. Let's allow God to bring us into peace, despite what the facts may be around you. And I, once I've got that peace, I can then start working towards changing the facts. So this is a very exciting time. And so those are the three that God supernaturally gives us through the Holy Spirit, so that we can hit solid anchors and pillars in our lives. And then he gives us three more that helps me walk my Christian life with my Christian brothers and sisters. All right? I have fruit that I can me, demonstrate towards those around me. Number one of those three is patience. On some translations, long suffering. This is patiently being able to put up with people who continually irritate you. You know, unfortunately, God doesn't work like I would like him to work. Let me explain why. God does not give me Christians who I can get on with all the time. Now, I know that you are super spiritual and you're on a different level. But for me, I struggle sometimes with some Christians. I sometimes say, God, if it wasn't for your saints, I'd be doing quite well right now. And so I need you to understand that God is looking for us to be on a supernatural level where we can have a supernatural long-suffering and patience with people even though they don't deserve it. Even though they might irritate you. Even though it's against your kind of person that you would hang out with normally. I want to say this. We have to operate in patience and long-suffering with God's people because He loves them. Alright, the Holy Spirit's work in us will help us in, increase our endurance in this area. That we can endure some nonsense and some strop sometimes. The number two is kindness. 
So I have endurance and patience with people, Christians. Then I need to operate kindness. There's some people that is, it's quite difficult to operate kindness in. Others are easy. You know, some people you could just flow with and say, Allah, you're nice, you're easy to be kind to. But there are others that are very difficult. There are others that deliberately try and push your button. But kindness means this, acting very charitable towards them. You are kind towards them as God is towards us. They don't always deserve it. Kindness takes the initiative in responding to others' needs. Are you prepared to respond to somebody else's needs? Are you prepared to respond to somebody else's needs? Are you actually prepared to step out and be there for them? Then number three is goodness. This is reaching out to do good to others. This is not just being kind to somebody. This is where you are actually doing good. Even if they don't deserve it. In other words, goodness does not react to evil, but absorbs the offense and responds in the positive action. Listen very carefully. Being kind to somebody is somebody who has a need. Being good to somebody is where I'm acting in an action that should not be equal to what I received. It is where I'm doing good instead of evil. So the Bible says, don't give evil for evil. Do good for evil. But the Bible goes further and it says that it will even heap up coals of fire on the head of edge. And so we need to believe and trust God that God is going to reach a level with each one of us where we are going to be able to practice goodness in our lives. Where God is going to help us to operate in a different spirit to what has been given to us and what's been coming our way. And so those are the three on the fruit that I need in my life if I want to genuinely help others around me, okay, and deal with Christian relationships. Patience, kindness, and goodness. Patience, kindness, and goodness. Long-suffering, meet the need, and operate in a different spirit. All right? Operating in a different spirit. Goodness is when somebody's ugly, I come and I do good to them, even if they don't deserve it. Now my question to you is this, is what is our level this evening? What level are you operating on? Are you still doing it according to the emotional level? Or are you actually allowing the Spirit of God to start working in your life? And bringing us into new levels, new realms. So that we can make a difference wherever we go and whatever we do. We're going to measure ourselves this evening. Alright, so now. What are the general traits? In other words, if I say that I'm a Christian. What are some of the main fruits? Besides love, joy and peace. What are the main fruits? Any of these nine are very important. But what are the ones that you're going to look at? Immediately to see a difference. What are the things that are going to make you stand out from those around you? Number one, faithfulness. Faithfulness. Now what does faithfulness means? mean? It means that I'm consistent. I'm faithful and consistent in what I do. If I pray, I'm consistently pray. If I read the word, I consistently read the word. If I study the Word, I consistently study the Word. I am reliable. I am trustworthy. So if I say that I am faithful, you can trust me. If I give you my Word, I will do it to the best of my ability. 
Now, some people have said that, you know, sometimes they give their word and they don't deliver on their word. Yes, stuff happens. I don't, I'm not saying that. But is your general trait one of being faithful? Are you generally known as somebody, if you give your word, you do it? You know, I've had to go right down to the basic things in this. It's easy to sit down and say, well, I'm going to do communion every day because everybody can see. But am I faithful in the things that people are not seeing? Am I faithful in my quiet time? Am I faithful in the things that I pray about or, or I commit to God and, and that I do with nobody sees, nobody even knows? You see, my children, when they were smaller, they used to take me on in this and say, God, Dad, you promised that we'll do something and some crisis rocks up and I don't get to do it. And so I had to go to my children when they were small even and repent of this thing and say, listen, I made a commitment. And it might be a simple thing like just going to the shop to buy an ice cream. And so I had to change my words. I had to change my commitment. I had to change what I said and did. So that I go and I do it properly in the name of Jesus. So that if I sit down to my child and I say I'm going to do something, it becomes an appointment in my diary and therefore I have to go and do what I said I was going to do. Otherwise, I should rather say, if I've got a chance, I can maybe do it. Let's see what happens later. But if I say I'm going to do it, there is a commitment that comes with that and I need to follow through. And that is called faithfulness. All right? The, a Christian should be a faithful individual. An individual who is faithful to his word and promises. An individual who can be trusted and confided in. Remember this, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to keep your mouth shut. I get into trouble because I share too little. In other words, people see me do something or people see me with somebody and they assume so much because nobody actually asks what's going on. Because I have been brought up or schooled in a thing that if somebody speaks to Janine, it's got nothing to do with me. I don't even ask about the conversation. I don't have the details. And the other thing is I believe in people's stuff being confidential. Because it's your story to tell. If you want to tell somebody something, you need to tell your story, not me. And so it's very important that we get seen as somebody like that. That's what a faithfulness person looks like. Then number two, gentleness. All right, what is gentleness? Well, somebody who does not come in like a bulldozer, and I promise you I can be a bulldozer. Let me tell you something. I have an anointing to bulldozer over something if I feel that it's ungodly or wrong. But at the same time, I need to be gentle with the human beings and the creation that God made. I need to be gentle. Now, what does it mean to be gentle? It means this. It means to be humble, considerate of others, submissive to God and His Word. All right? Now, I want to make the statement. Gentleness does not mean weakness. Just because I'm gentle does not mean that I don't do what God called me to do. It does not mean that I can be pushed over and just uh, discarded. Gentleness means that I'm just doing it in a nice way, but I'm still firm and solid in what God did. Just like Jesus handled the temple when he, pl uh, when he platted the whip. He did not go there emotionally. He went there quite gently, but he came in firmly. All right? He was not emotional and over the top, but he came in strong and firm in line with the word, but he did it in a gentle manner. Listen very carefully. Gentleness applies even force 
to be in the correct manner. The statement I'm going to make, I want you to listen very carefully. It's not what you do, it's how you do it. So in other words, I have to still fulfill what God said. I have to go in and cut whatever the devil's doing, but I can do it in a manner that does not hurt others. And so you can come very strong, very forceful, but yet come with a gentle spirit and still have the same results. And so God is looking for us to be gentle with His people and gentle with His creation. Number three, this is the tough one, self-control. This is the mastery over sinful human desires and their lack of restraint. In other words, we I just can't help myself. I just have to go and do something. I don't have control. So then I go and say what I want to say. I go do what I want to do. And God's saying, listen, this is not my fruit at all. You have always got self-control. When we surrender to God's will, initially we feel as though that we've lost control. Saying, God, yes, I had a plan. I had a, I mean, especially in my life, when I gave my heart to the Lord, I really felt like I lost my focus and where I wanted to go because I had so many plans where I was going. And I was still a young person. I mean, I got saved at eight. By eight, I already had some plans where I wanted to go. And I want to tell you, it does feel like that. But God leads us to exercise... Um, to exercise self-control that would be impossible in our own strength. Where you sit down and you know like you know like you know that you would normally lose it and you could stay calm in those environments and those situations. I can tell you and I can vouch for it. There are so many times where I know like I know that it's only by the Holy Spirit that I haven't lost it in the situation. And what's even more there have been situations where I've been able to keep my mouth shut and not even say anything because of the Spirit of God that is dwelling inside of me, not because of my natural temperament. So I want to conclude with this. It's always by the fruit of the Spirit. It's always by the Holy Spirit moving. It's always the fruit of the Spirit and not your own. And so I want to ask us tonight, are you prepared to submit to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, come and minister to me. Holy Spirit, come and work in my life like never before. Holy Spirit, come and show me what I need to do. Come and help me develop the fruit of the Spirit in my life so that the world can see what you have created me for. So that the world can see that I'm submitted to a living God. Let's pray. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I thank you for sending the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, I thank you for dying and sending the Holy Spirit. But Holy Spirit, we welcome you tonight. And so Holy Spirit, come and minister to each one of us. Thank you that you will help us operate in all of these nine fruits. Lord, I thank you that you are going to help us to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And Lord, I thank you that when the world looks at us and the Christians look at us and they judge our fruit, that they will see the fruit of the Spirit of God in our lives. And everything that we do will be done under the unction of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we surrender our lives to you today. We thank you, Lord, that as we say submitted to your word, that you will lead us, guide us, and direct us by your spirit. And we thank you, Lord, that we will never be the same again. And, Lord, that we will genuinely say submitted to your plan and purpose in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Well, saints, I want to congratulate for those who have started by session one. And you are very close to session 400. And I want to just say congratulations. But I want to remind you that you can join our college at any time. Please go to gibiblecollege.com. All the information is there. 
You can enroll at any time. Four years later, you'll come right back to this point and you will have a degree. And I wanted to just say, God bless you. Have an awesome evening. I love you lots. Please get ready. Uh, Pastor Les is up next. Bye-bye.